The Pit Bull Placebo Conclusions on Canine Aggression We are alone, absolutely alone on this chance planet, and, amid all the forms of life that surround us, not one, excepting the dog, has made an alliance with us. Maurice Maeterlinck, 1862-1949 Recently, in North Carolina, police responded to a report of a pit bull and a golden retriever fighting. One of the dogs was found tied to a tree with his front leg broken and deep gashes to his muzzle from the bites of the other dog. There can be little doubt as to which dog was injured and how this attack came to be. We have identified the two types of dogs involved in this incident, we know their history, we've read the newspaper headlines about which dogs are involved in aggression, we've listened to politicians state that certain breeds are the source of the dog bite problem, we've even heard some experts and laymen alike tell us of the uniqueness of the wounds pit bulls inflict during an attack, breaking of bones and tearing. And through all this we've come to know that there are dangerous and aggressive breeds and there are friendly, non-aggressive breeds of dogs. Today, the human-slash-dog bond the most complex and profound interspecies relationship in the history of mankind has been reduced to a simple axiom, breed of dog equals degree of dangerousness. Throughout the centuries, Dogs have elicited great pride, enduring love and extreme devotion from humans. It has never been uncommon for humans to risk their lives to save their beloved canine companions and dogs have more than returned this devotion in kind. However, as frequent as it is to find humans bestowing great affection upon their dogs, it is as frequent to find humans inflicting horrific abuse and cruelty upon our canine companions. What reasonable or sane person could expect dogs kept in such diametrically opposed conditions, cherished versus abused, to exhibit similar behaviors? How, in a society unparalleled in its access to information, have we been bullied into believing that the condition and treatment of our canine companions has no relevance on their future behaviors? And how have we become a society so ignorant and terrified of some dogs that we have allowed a wave of panic to sweep through our communities, allowing certain dogs to be banned, muzzled, restricted and killed by the hundreds of thousands in shelters across the nation? Consider how information about dog attacks has been disseminated over the last century. One hundred years ago newspapers provided vivid and often detailed accounts of dog attacks. Emotional and often anthropomorphic terms were used in an attempt to understand the factors that caused the dog to attack. Dogs were described as either vicious by nature or caused to be vicious. People were identified at times to be innocent victims or tormentors who invited an attack. Dogs were understood to be complex beings reacting to human behavior. The function and condition of dogs were often included in reports as they were understood to influence canine behavior. Fifty years ago newspapers continued to report dog attacks to be a result of cause and effect. Although dogs were no longer described in emotional terms, they were still portrayed as sentient beings that reacted to pain, discomfort, or fear. Additionally, many reports of dog attacks conveyed the understanding that aggression was a natural and expected behavior of dogs in certain circumstances. Owners and or victims were often identified in news reports as exhibiting behaviors, intentionally or unintentionally, that caused the dog to attack. Today the pit bull paparazzi are our source of information on dog attacks. Like their tabloid celebrity counterparts, the pit bull paparazzi are ever on the alert for any incident involving their high-profile subject, pushing past or ignoring all low-entertainment attacks, while zooming in on and hyping any incident involving the high entertainment 
pit bull. Theories about the breed, its history and temperament, are discussed, while details concerning the circumstances of the individual dog involved are not reported. Cause and effect or reasons for the attack are no longer found in reports, since breed is now recognized as sufficient information to explain aggression. Recently, some politicians have joined in the fray with their own brand of yellow journalism, touting wild claims about canine behavior of which they know little and seem to care less. In 2005, despite the fact that only one of Canada's 33 documented fatal dog attacks involved any type of dog even remotely resembling a pit bull, Ontario's Attorney General Michael Bryant began a campaign to rid the province of pit bulls. Spouting inane and false claims about pit bulls and aggression and refusing to consider the testimony of Ontario's own professional canine experts, the Attorney General pushed through legislation banning pit bulls in the entire province of Ontario. In addition to the news media and politicians, an unholy trilogy of misinformation has been formed with the Internet. The Internet has allowed for the rare incidents of severe and fatal canine aggression to be transmitted on a global scale, at times generating hundreds of sensational headlines from a single episode of aggression, grossly distorting our percept tie-ins as to the dangerousness of dogs and the frequency of attacks. Not only are these rare cases instantly accessible, but oftentimes they become retrievable for a seemingly infinite amount of time, providing a permanent record of selective cases of aggression. The information disseminated about pit bulls and aggression by the newspapers, politicians, and the Internet has led many to conclude that the solution to canine aggression is to rid society of the breeds of dogs found in reported attacks. And, since little to no information is revealed about the other circumstances contributing to an attack, breed is now found to be the only constant in reports of canine aggression. The solution or cure now touted for ridding communities of dangerous dogs is found in the guise of the pit bull placebo. Like the pharmacologically inactive sugar pill dispensed to placate a patient who supposes it to be medicine, eradication of the pit bull is heralded as the cure for severe dog attacks. However, a placebo is administered solely to appease a person's mental duress. In the present-day climate of fear and misinformation about pit bulls and dog attacks, eradication of the pit bull is the placebo administered to ease the public's mental anxiety. This, of course, does not address the underlying cause of why dogs attack and how they have been allowed access to their victims. Nor does this address why humans feel the need to have dogs that will intimidate, attack, or fight other beings. These factors, recognized for centuries as contributing to canine aggression, are dangerously ignored when a dog attack is deemed to be a product of breed. The distraction of blaming the breed of dog involved in attacks, while ignoring dangerous human behaviors, has created a climate of fear towards certain breeds. Paradoxically, this fear of pit bulls allows us to maintain our sense of well-being because it permits us to believe that canine aggression can be solved without introspection. If we truly believe that the extremely rare cases of fatal dog attacks merit extreme measures in the management of dogs if our concern and shock is genuine then we must be equally genuine and sincere in seeking out and addressing the real causes for these incidents. Hanging entire breeds of dogs in effigy for the actions of a minuscule percentage of their population, while ignoring the dangerous management practices of their owners, is not an effective or acceptable solution to canine aggression. Portraying two pit bulls abandoned in the basement of a vacant house that have desperately resorted to ingesting inedible objects and rat poison as family dogs is a grotesque distortion of the human-slash-dog bond. Furthermore, 
claiming that the agonizing and final behaviors of these suffering animals are proof of the aggressiveness of the breed is a monstrous mischaracterization of canine behavior. Only by acknowledging that a social hysteria has been spawned by the sensational and inaccurate reporting of dog attacks and only by extracting ourselves from the swirl of emotion, myths, rumors, and politics of dog attacks can we rationally and effectively address canine aggression in a way that may reduce these attacks. When we put aside our preconceived notions about breed behaviors and investigate the real causes for dog attacks, we come to discover that it was actually the Golden Retriever which initiated the attack against the Pit Bull in North Carolina and it was the Pit Bull who received the fractured front leg and severe bites described at the beginning of this chapter. Further investigation finds that the Golden Retriever had attacked and injured the Pit Bull at the goading and urging of his teenage owner. Had we simply allowed the breed of dog to explain this attack our conclusions would have been a complete misrepresentation of the facts. But the truth is that dog attacks are rarely investigated in such a way that reveal the real reasons why dogs attack. And so we have routinely come to draw totally inaccurate conclusions about canine behavior. These inaccurate assessments often lead to breed-specific legislation which is not only of no value in keeping communities safe, but has caused much anguish to responsible dog owners and has doomed hundreds of thousands of dogs to exile or death. It is long past time for us to rethink our policies about dog attacks and the role humans play in this interspecies relationship. We owe it to the future safety of our children and communities. We owe it to our canine companions. Denver, Colorado, evidence used to ban pit bulls, breed-specific legislation. In 1989, the Denver City Council enacted an ordinance making it unlawful to own, possess, keep, exercise control over, maintain, harbor, transport, or sell within the city any pit bull. A pit bull was defined by Denver as any dog that is an American pit bull terrier, American Staffordshire terrier, Staffordshire bull terrier, or any dog displaying the majority of physical traits of any one, one, or more of the above breeds, or any dog exhibiting those distinguishing characteristics which substantially conform to the standards established by the American Kennel Club or United Kennel Club for any of the above breeds. In 2005, Denver's assistant city attorney, Corey Nelson, in defending the ban on pit bulls in the city in the findings of the court which found pit bulls to be different than other dogs, claimed that there is only new relevant evidence that adds additional support for breed-specific legislation, as the differential treatment of pit bulls is based upon logical, rational evidence from the scientific field of ethology, canine behavior. The logical, rational evidence from the scientific field of ethology that Denver introduced and their city attorney continues to tout as proof of the differentness of pit bulls is in reality critically flawed, limited and inaccurate data and is a combination of pseudoscience, anecdotal evidence, media-generated hysteria, and unexplainable conclusions drawn from irrelevant data interpreted by those who have little to no knowledge about the field of ethology. In hearings defending the ban on pit bulls, Denver presented 15 reasons or evidence explaining that, as a group, pit bulls are different than other breeds of dogs. The trial court, while not believing all of Denver's 15 claims about the dangerousness of pit bulls, did find evidence to support the following. 1. Biting the court finds no scientific evidence proving that the biting power of pit bull dogs exceeds that of other dogs. However, the city did prove that they inflict more serious wounds than other breeds. They tend to attack the deep muscles, to hold on, to shake, and to cause ripping of tissues. 
pit bull attacks were compared to shark attacks. The major flaw in all of the conclusions drawn by the court about the behaviors and temperament of the pit bull is the failure to use a significant study population and the use of seriously flawed and inaccurate data presented by the city of Denver as evidence. Because severe and, to a much larger degree, fatal attacks are relatively rare, and since the focus of most epidemiological studies in the past two decades has been on breed only, there was a scarcity of comprehensive data on the types of injuries other breeds of dogs have inflicted and, as such, no valid comparison could be made between the types of wounds inflicted by pit bulls versus other breeds of dogs. Shaking, holding and tearing are not breed-specific behaviors they are canine behaviors. Injury to deep muscles and the ripping of tissue are easily and frequently accomplished by any large dog during the process of a severe attack. The fact is, one cannot examine autopsy reports or autopsy photographs and determine the breed of dog by the injuries inflicted. There are hundreds of examples of grievous, tearing, type injuries inflicted by other breeds of dogs. They were simply not entered into evidence or presented to the court. The shark analogy has been discussed in Chapter 11, but will be addressed here as it was presented by the city of Denver. Denver introduced a plastic surgeon from Arizona to testify as to the specific types of injuries caused by pit bulls. Despite the fact that this plastic surgeon had stated he had personally treated only three non-fatal cases of victims attacked by pit bulls, he was nevertheless entered into the record as an expert witness. To bolster his lack of personal experience with victims of pit bull and shark attacks, this witness then entered into the record the alleged learned treatise on the subject of reconstructive surgery in pit bull attacks printed in a Texas medicine report. The following claim was read from this study and entered into court record as evidence. 14 of the 20 recorded fatal dog attacks on people between October 1983 and November 1986 were from pit bulls or pit bull mixes. During the one-year period between June 1986 and June 1987, 14 people were killed by dogs in the United States, 10 of those 14 deaths are attributed to pit bulls. Thus, 71% of the deaths during that period were attributed to a type of dog that accounts for 1% of the dog population. The fact is that from October 1983 to November 1986, at least 48 people were killed by dogs in the United States, not 20. Of the 28 fatal attacks shockingly absent in this study, 24 were by breeds of dogs other than pit bulls. Point three, this degree of statistical error is so significant that it renders any conclusions based on this data invalid. That errors of this magnitude were entered into court records to prove the dangerousness of pit bulls is highly disturbing. Equally distressing is another claim reported in this study, Texas Medicine Report, and entered into evidence that pit bull attacks are like shark attacks. The report states, most breeds do not repeatedly bite their victims, however, a pit bull attack has been compared to a shark attack and often results in multiple bites and extensive soft tissue loss. The study cited two sources for this claim. Prophylactic antibiotics in common dog bite wounds, controlled study, Annals of Emergency Medicine. The Pit Bull, Friend and Killer, Sports Illustrated. The first cited source is a detailed medical journal report on the management of dog bite wounds. There is no mention or reference to pit bulls or sharks anywhere in this study. The second cited source is not a scientific or medical journal study but an article written in Sports Illustrated magazine.
The only reference to sharks versus pit bulls is found in a comment by a field officer from a humane society when he stated, a pit bull attack is like a shark attack. He keeps coming back. It hardly needs to be said that a single comment from a single person, quoted in a Sports Illustrated magazine article, does not qualify as evidence to be used in a scientific journal, nor does it qualify as evidence by which a court can uphold a claim that pit bull attacks are found to be like shark attacks. 2. Destructiveness The court finds that some pit bull-type dogs, due to their strength and athletic ability, can damage facilities and equipment. There is a disproportionate number of attacks by chained pit bull dogs which is indicative of their strength. There is simply no way to explain how the court could possibly have come to the conclusion that being attacked by a chained dog is indicative of strength. It simply is not a reasonable or valid conclusion. The only possible explanation is that they were basing this finding on a chained dog breaking a restraint and then attacking a person, breaking a chain allegedly being indicative of strength, see finding number 6 addressing this. 3. Fighting Ability and Killing Instinct Importantly, there was no evidence that any AKC-registered American Staffordshire Terrier or Staffordshire Bull Terrier or any UKC-registered American Pit Bull Terrier was involved in any severe or fatal attack. Nevertheless, the city did prove that unregistered pit bull-type dogs were responsible for a disproportionate number of severe or fatal attacks on other dogs and human beings. Credible testimony also proved that, when a pit bull dog begins to fight, it often will not retreat. Since the data on fatal attacks presented by the city was so significantly flawed and biased, see finding number one, it is little wonder that pit bull attacks appeared disproportionate to the court. As for the often will not retreat remark, see finding number four. Four, frenzy. Many aggressive and vicious dogs can become uncontrollable when excited or challenged. No credible evidence proved that pit bull dogs were more likely to enter a frenzied state than other dogs. However, the evidence proved that once pit bull type dogs do attack, they are less likely to retreat than other dogs. These two findings of the court contradict each other. The court found that pit bulls are not more likely to become frenzied or uncontrollable than other breeds of dogs, but were less likely to retreat. A frenzied, Uncontrollable attack by a dog is highly aberrant and abnormal behavior. The very definition of frenzied is wildly uncontrollable or abnormally excessive. What the court is implying is that other breeds behave normally during a frenzied attack and pit bulls behave abnormally during a frenzied attack. Also, how can retreat be defined or measured in a frenzied and uncontrolled attack? At what point in time is retreat during a frenzy determined to be normal versus abnormal? One minute or five minutes after the attack. When the victim stops moving. When the dogs are subjected to other stimuli or interference. None of these components were defined or accounted for, yet the court, nevertheless, concluded that anecdotal evidence presented by the city was sufficient to find that pit bulls were less likely to retreat. 5. Manageability American Staffordshire Terriers, Staffordshire Bull Terriers, American Pit Bull Terriers, and their mixed breeds can make excellent, gentle pets. Nevertheless, credible testimony proved that proper handling, including early socialization to humans, is very important for these dogs. Even their most ardent admirers agree that these dogs are not for everyone and they require special attention and discipline. 
The Lockwood study reported that 13.3% of pit bull type dogs attacked their owners as compared with 2.2% of other dogs. The study from which these claims are based, Lockwood, did not identify or define the relationship between the owner and the dog. Was the owner an abusive owner? Was the dog maintained on a chain 100 feet from the owner's residence? How long did the owner have the dog, one day, one month, or five years? These are extremely important details that explain behavior and aggression, yet they were not defined, accounted for, or qualified, rendering any conclusions or statistics about aggression towards owners meaningless. The court found that pit bulls can make excellent and gentle pets, yet stated it was important for pit bulls to receive proper handling and early socialization to humans. If pit bulls can become excellent and gentle pets with proper handling and socialization, then how is this evidence that the breed is different than any other breed? This finding of the court about the manageability of pit bulls has been recognized for centuries as the essence of all dogs it is the very foundation on which thousands of years of dog ownership and management have been based. Proper handling and early socialization to humans is how all dogs come to be excellent and gentle pets and certainly is not a characteristic particular to pit bulls. 6. Strength. Pit bull dogs are stronger than many other dogs. The evidence showed that 42.7% of the pit bull type dogs attacked while restrained, defendants exhibit CC and plaintiffs exhibit 50. The court came to this totally inaccurate conclusion quoting data that in no way implied or supported this. The statistics used to prove strength was a study that stated 42.7% of pit bull type dogs attacked while restrained. The entire quote from this study reads, virtually all the dogs in the cases we studied were owned. A surprising number, however, were restrained at the time of the attack. In the case of pit bull bites, 61 of 143, 42.7%, involved animals that were fenced, chained, or inside prior to the incident. 20 cases, 14%, involved pit bulls that escaped by jumping fences or breaking chains immediately before the attack. Of the 135 cases involving other breeds, 36, 26.7%, involved restrained animals, but only one, 0.7%, broke restraint to initiate the attack. The authors of this study did not imply or suggest that this statistic was indicative of strength. The authors of this study defined restraint to be animals that were fenced, chained, or inside prior to the incident. How does 42.7% of pit bulls attacking someone while fenced, chained or inside a house indicate strength. An equally disturbing possibility is that Denver, and or the trial court, used the wrong statistic, meaning they should have used the 14% quoted in this study of pit bulls jumping fences or breaking chains as indicative of strength. But again, this would be an inaccurate and totally baseless conclusion since the type and strength of the restraint is not defined and therefore cannot be used as evidence of strength. For example, was the fence these pit bulls jumped three feet high or five feet high? Did all of these owners use chains with the same thickness and gauge? Did the pit bull break loose of a bicycle chain or a logging chain? None of these vital qualifiers were taken into account or measured, therefore any conclusions about the strength of any of the dogs in this study are invalid. 7. Unpredictability The evidence showed that most dog attacks, by all breeds, are unprovoked. However, pit bull dogs, unlike other dogs, 
often give no warning signals before they attack. This is simply not true. All information about provocation and warning signals from any breed of dog is anecdotal at best and, at worst, unreliable, see chapters 11, 12, 13. A large majority of victims of dog attacks are very young children. Young children are most frequently bitten by dogs precisely because they are unable to read and understand the warning signals that dogs so often give prior to an attack. Also, in a highly litigious society, both victims and owners are increasingly less than truthful about their involvement or behavior preceding a dog attack, making their testimony about provocation suspicious. Additionally, any cases in which media accounts were used as evidence to support the argument that dog attacks are unprovoked are meaningless, as the media is not a credible or impartial source of information on the nature or behavior of dogs involved in attacks. Denver, Colorado, an ineffective and uninformed approach to dog attacks. After a fatal dog attack in 1986 and a severe dog attack in 1989 in Denver, Colorado, the city-slash-county of Denver enacted a ban against pit bulls and any dog which may be determined to resemble a pit bull, the type of dog involved in these two attacks. The city-slash-county of Denver chose to blatantly ignore the dangerous and irresponsible behavior of the owners of these dogs and instead placed the blame for these attacks squarely on the back of a breed of dog. Not addressed by their breed-specific legislation was how these dogs had access to their victims, nor was the maintenance, function, condition or history of the dogs and their owners considered relevant. An examination of appendices A and B demonstrates that the breeds of dogs involved in severe and fatal attacks change over the decades. A serious analysis of severe and fatal attacks reveals that while the breeds change, many of the circumstances surrounding these attacks are seen with remarkable consistency throughout the last 150 years. The factors which contribute to canine aggression and have been found consistently in cases of fatal dog attacks over the past century are Dogs obtained and maintained for negative functions This includes dogs obtained for fighting, guarding, and protection, dogs used for intimidation or as status symbols, and dogs being bred for financial gain. Failure of owners to humanely care for and control their dogs This includes owners who maintain dogs on chains or allow dogs to run loose, owners who fail to socialize, train and supervise their dogs, owners who abuse or neglect their dogs, and owners who allow or encourage their dogs to behave aggressively. Young unsupervised children and dogs This includes newborns left alone with dogs, young children allowed to interact with unfamiliar dogs or children allowed to play with multiple resident dogs, pack, without adult supervision. Reproductive status of dog This includes intact animals actively used for breeding, bitches guarding puppies, pregnant bitches, and intact males in the vicinity of a female dog in estrus. In the decade from 1966 to 1975, Fewer than 2% of all dogs involved in fatal attacks in the United States were of the breeds which today are targeted so frequently as the solution to canine aggression, pit bull or rottweiler. However, one or more of the critical factors listed above were evidenced in over 90% of the fatal attacks during these years. An examination of fatal dog attacks Colorado 1963 to 2006. 1963 Boulder. An unsupervised two year old boy was attacked and killed by one of two chained husky dogs in the backyard of a duplex where he lived. The owner of the dogs had gone on a three day fishing trip and left the dogs unattended without food or water. 1977 Breckenridge. 
The owners of three dogs responsible for killing a six-year-old girl were charged with crim inally negligent homicide. The girl was walking to a friend's home when the dogs, a St. Bernard, Norwegian Elkhound and German Shepherd slash Husky mix, attacked her, biting her repeatedly. A man caring for the dogs while one owner was out of town was also charged with criminally negligent homicide as the dogs were off the property when they attacked the girl. 1985 Littleton A five-year-old boy was killed by his babysitter's Doberman Pinscher. The intact, male dog mauled the child while he was playing with the dog. 1986 Denver an unsupervised three-year-old boy was attacked and killed when he wandered away from home and over to a chained, intact female pit bull. The owner of the dog had previously been sued, charged and was on probation after another one of his dogs severely bit an eight-year-old child three years previously. Since he was unable to pay the medical bills of the previous victim, the civil suit against him was dropped. Undaunted by his inability to meet his financial and moral responsibility to the previous victim of one of his dogs, this owner proceeded to obtain additional dogs and maintain them in an environment which invited aggression, intact, chained, unsocialized, etc. One of these dogs would later be the dog responsible for the attack on the unsupervised three-year-old child. Instead of instituting laws to severely penalize or punish owners such as this who repeat, deadly obtain dogs, breed these dogs, and maintain these animals in a condition in which they have the ability and opportunity to attack children, Denver opted to ban the breed of dog. 1990 Arapaho County A four-year-old boy wandered out of his house and was killed by a neighbor's loose roaming dog. The male dog was identified to be either a Chow-slash-Malamute mix or a Malamute. The dog was maintained primarily as a chained or outside dog. The owner was charged with letting a dog run loose and harboring a vicious animal. 1994 North Glen A woman had borrowed a 120 pounds male Rottweiler from a friend for protection. Two days later her five-year-old daughter was playing on a swing in the backyard when the dog snatched her from the swing and shook her like a rag doll. Only later was it discovered that the intact, male dog had a history of aggression and previously attacked another child in 1993. 1996 Black Forest Two wolf hybrids attacked and killed their caretaker, a 39-year-old woman. The woman was attempting to get them back into a pen when the dogs turned on her and killed her. The wolf dogs were a male and female used for breeding and kept in outside pens. The woman was dragged over one-tenth of a mile by the animals as they continued their attack. 1998, Denver A neutered, male rot slash mastiff mix attacked and killed a 21-month-old boy, as the child was crawling on the floor towards his father, seated on the couch. This fatal attack is the rare exception to the rule in which the parents slash owners had neutered the dog, had it obedience trained and maintained the dog as a household pet. Additionally, unlike most fatal attacks, the child and dog were in the presence of supervising adults at the time of the attack. 2003 Ebert County Three loose roaming intact pit bulls attacked and killed a 40-year-old woman in her barn. These dogs and their owners were well known in the community due to previous aggressive episodes involving the dogs and the owners repeatedly allowing these, and other dogs, to roam the area, harassing and attacking other beings. One neighbor had previously sustained a very severe bite to her leg from dogs alleged to belong to these owners. The female owner was convicted of owning dangerous dogs resulting in a death, and received a six-year prison sentence.
The male owner of these dogs fled the jurisdiction, was a suspect in a murder case in another state and was finally apprehended in 2005. 2005 Fruita A seven-year-old girl was attacked and killed after her mother left her in the yard alone with newly acquired male and female Malamutes. It is believed only the male attacked the girl and the child was dead when the mother re-emerged from the house a few minutes later. An examination of fatal attacks in the state of Colorado reveals that not only are these incidents incredibly rare, 10 fatal attacks in the state over a 45-year period, 1962 to 2006, but they involve complex human and canine behaviors. Denver's approach to the first documented fatal attack in the state of Colorado by a pit bull-type dog was to ban the breed. There was no examination or discussion of previous fatal attacks in Colorado or the critical role owners play in allowing their dogs to behave aggressively. Denver chose to criminalize a breed of dog rather than enact laws that would impose strict penalties to control the behavior of dangerous dog owners.